Welcome to Fireside Chat with Emmanuel, where you get to ask Emmanuel questions about honestly anything. We just get to hear his thoughts and his life story, and we can learn a lot from him. And we're going to start off with 30 minutes of Q&A. Before we start, I want to say thank you, Pat, for putting this together. You've been amazing, and I hope that we're going to have an awesome time um, for the next, let's say, hour or so together and the other participants are alive. And to start off, Emmanuel, the first question is, what is the best advice you can give to plan a career rather than just keep a job? So what is um, the best career advice that I can give to someone starting off? Is that the, the, the exact question? Kind of. So let's say there's somebody who wants to plan a career, so more long term, and they want to have the best advice for that rather than just keeping a job short term. Ah, so that's a, that's a tough question, and for two reasons. The first is because of finances, right? Because most often we make um, career decisions based on how much money we earn. And what I have learned is that when you when you try to follow the things that you are passionate about, number one, and that you're good at, then you'll be you you're happy doing what you're doing. So you know there's this cliche saying, if you love what you're doing, you don't work a day in your life, right? Although I don't think that holds true hundred percent, but I think it makes the process of getting or getting the job done much easier. So I would say, you know, figure out go and have a soul search, right? Yeah. Think about what makes you happy. Think about what you want for yourself and find out the things that you're good at. And when you put those two things together, you are going to figure out the career path that is good for you. And generally that serves you long-term better than just trying to go and find a job or a major that earns a lot of money. And the reason for this is because I've seen a lot of people that go into investment banking. And as you may know, investment banking, there's a lot of money, right? When you, I've seen a lot of people that go into finance that they just want a consultant and they stay too long in that career because they want the benefits out of it. Although there are certain benefits that you gain from it, but the real question is, do you love what you do? Do you go and you solve people's problem and that fulfills you, right? Do you go back to your house and you don't feel, you don't feel disgruntled by the work environment that you live in or by the job that you're doing, right? So I think it's about, you know, doing a soul search and figuring out what's important to you, what makes you happy, what environment you want to work in and what career path you want to go to and be, 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 be very honest with yourself. Are you good at what you're doing? Right. And when you put all those things, two, three or four things together, you're going to realize that you're going to figure out what works for you. So I don't have one answer. It's just more so a formula that I've used for myself. So how did you do the soul search for yourself? <sighs> so funny thing, when I talk to a lot of people, they actually do not know that my undergrad is in environmental sciences. And that, 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 that threw people over a lot. And when I was younger, I wanted my whole life was to be a doctor. And before being a doctor, I wanted to be an astronaut. Of course, super cool jobs, right? But not everybody gets to be a doctor. Not everybody gets to be an astronaut. And I was pretty good at biology. So when I went into uh, my undergrad and I started studying environmental sciences, one thing I knew for sure, and this is something that I know goes transcends my careers, because you can see environmental science, that's a different career trajectory than what I'm doing right now, or than being an astronaut or a doctor, right? So, but what I, what I know for, for a fact is that I always wanted to be in a position to help others, right? Regardless of what it is, it could be the world at large, or it could be some individual, right? Or it could be just, you know, the, just a cause that I care about. And throughout my life, I always make sure that it, it's in line with those values that I have. So when I went into environmental sciences, I realized that although it was good, it was very limiting in terms of the opportunities that presented itself when I was back in Cameroon, which is where I'm from originally. So I, I knew that if I wanted to be an environmental scientist, it was going to lead me back into just one or two areas that I didn't really want it to be there for the long term. And I had an opportunity to, to travel to the United States to follow my dreams, to follow my passion. And when I, when, when I, when I came to the United States, I realized that, you know, there was not a very strong environmental science community like the like it is in Europe because Europe is there, like they're very pro the environment 
um, as opposed to the relative to the United States. So I, re- I, I, I took a step back and I realized, I said, what did I want to do? And the university that I went to, there was not enough opportunities for me to still go back into the environmental science um, you know, field of study. So I took a step back and I said, okay, what can I do with the opportunities that I was surrounded with? I always have a knack for business, for entrepreneurship. I'm not going to go into all that, into all of those details right now. And when I make, I, when I did my own SWOT analysis, what I was good at, what I wasn't good at, I realized that you know strategic thinking and problem solving was something that I've always been good at, right, right from the the, the start. And I could I could maybe trace that maybe back onto middle school or something. So I decided to do general MBA, not knowing exactly what I was going to go into, and I started. You know, fidgeting around with different areas, marketing, business, finance. And I realized that marketing gave me that same opportunity to help businesses. So still go back to service and helping others. But the problem with that was that with marketing, I was trying to make money versus helping people. So I'll go into a small business. It was all about how can I solve a problem, but how much can you pay me for it? So it wasn't something that was fulfilling to me. And I decided, you know, you know, the whole story, Amir and Upkey, it came together in a very, very nice way because I am using my skills, my business skills that I learned and that I've gathered through the years to solve a larger problem, not because of money. Because an example is going to be the VIP program. It's not because we are trying to make money. It's because we want to help people. It's all for service. So I would say five years ago, I did my soul search to understand that, you know, Trying to help small businesses to make $1,000 for retainers was not what I wanted, was not fulfilling, but more so giving myself to a larger cause that didn't have any financial return short term. Would you say soul searching is a lifelong process or do you just do it once and then you figure it out along the way afterwards? Ah. Hmm. So... It's, it's definitely a lifelong process, right? It's not something that you do once and then it holds true for the next, for the rest of your life, right? Because as I said, when I look back at when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. If I didn't go back and do, I always call it my internal sort analysis, right? I would have just been blind to all opportunities that presented itself to me. So for sure, 100% I'll say it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a lifelong, it's a life, it's a, it's a long-term kind of like, um, it's, it's a lifelong piece of your life, both career and personal, that you need to always have and be aware of and to know that if something is not going right, if something is not right in my life, then there could be something that I could reevaluate. And then that's to me, that's so searching. So I, I'll for sure say it's not something that you do in a one, on a one-off basis. So. All right, great. So that's very that's very informative because all of the interns at VIP, they're not doing it for money. We're definitely learning something every day. So that's really interesting. On to the next question. What do you do to constantly challenge your underlying beliefs and assumptions? That's a loaded question. But... I <laughs> okay. So um, if you, what do I do to challenge my underlying beliefs? <laughs> Spiritual beliefs um social beliefs educational beliefs. give me some things to go off here all right let's do how about let's do your values in business my values in business cool all right so what do i do to challenge my values in business so okay <clears throat> on the line every single thing right I, I i try to ask myself this one question Everything that I am doing, just both personal and professional, does it, is it, is the goal to have a larger impact than just benefiting myself, right? On the line, everything, that's what I ask myself. And when I go to, into my business mode and I look at where my values are stemming from, they are stemming from my culture my religious belief, my social belief, and just my belief towards humanity and my values towards humanity. And my value towards humanity is to act in a responsible way that doesn't just benefit myself, but has a larger impact into, to my community, to the people around me, and to the society at large. So if I see myself going astray, if I see myself meandering towards a direction that doesn't necessarily have the bigger picture first, then I always do, let me use the word soul search, right? Or I always, you know, reflect back and and, and talk to my demons, like what's going on, right? And I try to go back to the source and reevaluate why. 
And when I reevaluate why, it always boils down to one thing. Is the answer going to help me get back to my to the track, which is going to be to have an impact to um, in my community or the larger um, society, the, the society at large? And generally, it helps me. I don't really change my values because my values are things that I hold true to myself. They have a very deep root, just not just something that is built in a day or in a year. So I try not to change my values. Of course, I'm open to listening. I'm open to, 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 to new, to people, to give me your own perspective. But doing something that is for the good of humanity, for the good of other peoples and being selfless, I try not to change that because I truly believe that if we have people that are more selfless, people that really want to help others succeed versus just making themselves more profitable, we're going to have a better community. We're going to have an environment and a society that presents opportunities to people that don't have those opportunities. So on the line, everything, I try not to think about changing my beliefs, but ensuring that if I'm deviating from those things that I value, I ask myself why. That's really good advice. Um, so you mentioned how you always try to make sure that you help other people through business, but since you do work in business, there's always that money part of business. So how do you balance? Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. So the cool thing about business is that no matter how you want to be uh, a, a, you know, a social entrepreneur, you want to make sure that the community is safe. The community have the resources that they need to, um, to, to have better economic opportunities you want to stay in business because if you're not in business, guess what? The sharks are going to come in and they're going to tear it apart. Right? So mm -hmm. it's about fairness. And it's about equal. It's about a, 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 a responsible distribution of equity for me. And what I mean by that is equity. Sometimes people really confuse that to money. Right? I, I think about it as, as opportunities. If I want to stay in business, who are the players that should pay for this? And when, when I look at the way my business values are set up, you have a lot of people that you could charge a hefty amount of money from. You have people that need the service and you have people that can pay for the service. Those are kind of two different things. And to be very specific with what I do right now is when I'm trying to help students succeed, when I'm trying to help students have more equitable access to resources, and based on the virtue of the population that we work with, right? We work with a lot of first generation college students, students from low income families and low income communities. There is not a lot of disposable income in those communities. However, we have multinational corporations that earn billions of dollars in profits every year. And, this, and, and those companies should be pouring and giving back to the communities. So what I try to do is I try to ensure that the people that can pay for these services, because most of these companies, they serve these communities, but don't really invest back into the communities in a meaningful way. So how can I make these companies reinvest back into those communities that they serve, that they, they, they sell to, right? So I try to make sure like I understand those dynamics. And I make sure that the people that really can pay for my services, pay for it. The companies that are the global bohemians, that are Fortune 100 or Fortune 1000, that have the income to pay, that make a lot of money from these communities, they should find a chunk in their large coffers to reinvest back in those communities. And the people that need those services, the people that I really truly want to serve, they should not have to bother about paying a hundred extra dollars for my service. Meanwhile, they have families to serve. Meanwhile, they have books to buy. Meanwhile, they have bills to pay. Because guess what? If they don't pay the bill, they don't pay the mortgages, what happened? Then homelessness. They, you see they start having a lot of struggles. They can feed themselves. They can have insurance. They can have the, necessity, the necessities that they need to survive. So I try to make sure that I understand the dynamics of people that I serve and who can pay for the service. And I go after the people that can pay for the services. And when I do that, I don't mind charging companies that in a hundred billion dollars in profit, you know, a couple of millions every year. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that because it's all part of the good. It's all part of the service to ensure that those people that need the service have the services. Absolutely. So you get the people who can pay to pay and you help the people who can't pay. Absolutely. Yeah. I, th I think if we do that, then people are going to be in much better shapes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was also going to, I was wondering about how you challenge your underlying social beliefs or religious beliefs as well. Hmm. So from business to social belief, how do I, okay, I'm, 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 
I'm a, I'm, I am a student of life. I, I like, at least I try to tell myself that most people think that I can be very one-sided in certain beliefs, which, which is okay. I don't think we are, I don't think we should change everything, but I think we should be willing to listen. And the thing with me is like, I, I'm someone that I consider myself fairly um, open-minded, but yet not easily persuaded. So with my social beliefs, and granted, right, I'm not from the United States and I live in the United States. So culture is, is huge and culture is part of your social, social cultural beliefs. I, I, they're intertwined, right? So in terms of my social belief, you know, there, it's, it can be looked at in so many ways, Patricio. And the way, the way I look at it is if I am from an environment that I, I wasn't born in, if I'm from, I'm in a society that have a history like every other society does, I try to ensure that I am educated, right? That I'm informed. And we all carry our biases into an environment, into a new environment. I'm from Africa, I'm from Cameroon, I'm from Limbe, the South Ridge region. I live by, close to the Atlantic Ocean. It's so different from Chicago. We have a fake lake here. And to me and to the people of Chicago, that is their own natural beauty. And I appreciate that, right? So it's all about going into an environment, understanding what the norms are and figuring the ways that they align. And when, the, when, I, fa- when I face things that I, I, I'm not really knowledgeable, knowledgeable about, I try to listen. And sometimes it's hard to change your beliefs because they are things that you grew, grew up with. An example is going to be their perception about an African-American in Africa. So me as a black man in Africa, what do I think of an African-American in America, regardless of the fact that our skin color are the same, that doesn't mean that we have the same cultural ties. Even if on the line everything, we are one, but we grew up in two different environments. So when I get to America, my perspective about socially about who an African-American is or what a Caucasian woman or man is, is just based on where I grew up. So in order for me to understand the environment and the people that I'm going to network with, I'm going to meet, that I'm going to be friends with, I need to listen. And more often than not, it's going to be different. But I always try to make sure that I am not blinded by what others are telling me. You know, there is this guy, Jordan Peterson, he always says this, if you go into a conversation and willing to listen, then there'll be an off chance that someone's gonna tell you something that you don't know. But you're only gonna get that if you are listening and you are open to change or open at least to a new perspective. So that's how I carry myself into the, in, into the world, you know, with all the movement going on, especially with the dead of Joy Floyd. I can, I, I, I can imagine what the racial disparities that African-Americans have been facing in America for the past, what, couple of hundred years. I cannot, I cannot be in that position. I can try, but I didn't grow up in those communities. I didn't grow up in the South of Chicago, right? I didn't grow up in the West. I live in the West side of Chicago, but I didn't grow up here. I can try to listen, but the only way I'm going to be able to understand and appreciate that difference is to be able to, is to be willing to listen to those people and understand them and hopefully see why. So that's how I approach social cultural differences that's really interesting so when has there ever been a time when you had to remind yourself to listen to other people every day (laughs) (laughs) every day yeah i'm a pretty stubborn guy so um i yes every day like yeah a lot more than you more than i would like more than i would like to admit let me tell you that (laughs) yeah but what's helped you remember that what's helped me remember that is you know, there was this time when I, when I came to the United States, I went to a Lutheran university. I wasn't always happy with the fact that people were not willing to listen to me. And I knew how I felt. So today, tomorrow, last night, last week, last year, for a while now, I always think about what, I was, what if I was in that person's shoe? What if the tables were turned around? Would I want to be listened to? Yes, I would like to be listened to. 
So whenever I'm going astray, I put myself in the person's shoe. Not necessarily I'm going to change my perspective, but I should give a listening ear. Mm -hmm. Understanding other people. Yeah, understanding other people. That's good. So I want to switch off to books. I was just wondering, do you have any books that you recommend everybody read at least once in their lifetime? Whoa. So I was talking about this to some of the folks that are helping me put the VIP program together. And I'm a pretty, pretty dark guy. And when I mean dark, I mean dark. Not personally, but in terms of what I read. So what? What sort of dark books do you read then? Okay. Have you heard about the gulags? Okay. Oh, wait, book or like historically? Yeah, historically, but it's a book. Historically. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. So there is this guy called Alexander Solzhenitsky and or um, this writer called Anne Applebaum. So she recounts, she has this book that recounted and relieved the experiences that happened in the 1930s to like the 90, late 1940s. And it's all about what happened in Nazi Germany and the Holocaust and the gulags and all the concentration camps and all the killings that happened and all the terrible things that happen. So it's a pretty long book. I have a lot of other cool books that I can talk about, you know, when it comes to leadership. But the reason why I want to talk about, you know, understanding history is because I truly believe that in order for us to know how to best live today or how to predict the future in terms of how we're going to build our societies, is understand what happened in the past. And we think about predictions. Everything that has been predicted accounted, took into account what happened in the past, regardless of what it is, science, culture, fiction, whatever. It's always about taking the past, looking at the present, predicting the future. So the Gulag is, 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 is a book that recounts the evil of Nazi Germany, of Adolf Hitler, and all the terrible things that happened during those times, and figuring out why, and telling you why those things happened, and how, and the results of it. And I, and I am saying that it's good to, read, to, to understand history because the history of humankind is because we are not so different from those people. We are capable of evil. And looking at why the evil of the past happened would give us an understanding of what, how to dissect our current environments to understand what not to do. So I think it's important that students, people, Look at the past. Look at what happened in, in, in the past. Look at all the mass killings that happened in the past. Why? There are very, there, there, there are very broad ranging psychological and fundamental, cultural fundamental, you know, um, beliefs that those people had. And figuring out how can I not put myself in that situation? Because everyone is capable of evil. You might think you might, you, you're a good person, but when you, when, you, when you think about the gulags and all, and all the Auschwitz um, at the camps in Germany, Auschwitz, or uh, yeah, Auschwitz, and you, you think about you know, the guard, the prisoners became the guards. So you could be put in a situation where your evil genes would override your good genes and you do the things that you think you're never capable of. So it's all about understanding that we are capable of evil and understanding that how can I recognize when I'm going towards that path of evil and readjusting and reevaluating? Mm -hmm. Do you ever think that maybe power has a lot to do with absolutely when evil genes go over? Absolutely, power, right? Yeah, it's, it's it's all about control and power, and 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 you know, you know, I don't I don't want to go into all of that, but it, yes, power has something to do with it. You know, survival, and when you look at um, I don't wish Darwin. I don't think we should live our, our life in a Darwinian manner. But mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I believe in, a, in in evolution, and I believe in a Darwinian theory of evolution. So yes, I think that you know power, survival of the fetus, making sure that your type, your group, you know, is 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 on top of the hierarchy chain to benefit the most is is something that we all do today in politics, in, in business, everywhere. To be honest with you. Mm -hmm. 
I know you mentioned that you need to look in the past, you need to look at history before you go and look at the future. So how do you do that personally? How do I do that? I study, you know, I look at, I, the only, the best way to, to, to educate yourself on the past is to study. And of course, they're going to be, I don't, I don't know if you're a conspiracy theorist, but it's a lot of like different kind of like theories about what happened in the past. So I try to educate mm-hmm. myself. And that's why I think, you know, one of the things that I, I, I strongly believe as a 21st century skill is critical thinking. And critical thinking is a good skill to have because you need to evaluate the information that you receive and figure out what is right or what, what and, and you know, what is right, it could be subjective sometimes. Like, you know, you, you, it's not straightforward to think about what is right, but you need to have your mind to evaluate why you're accepting this as your truth. So I try to study and I try to compare and contrast things and make up my own mind, right? My, 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 my perception, my, my idea about how we should live our life today based on what we learned in the past is different. It could be different from yours. It could be different from, you know, Michaela. It could be different from Irene. It could be different from Danny's. It could be different from a lot of people. But I try to make that decision for myself based on, inform, but based on the information that I receive through what, you know, the history in the past can provide me. Do you think that there is a lack of critical thinking sometimes in certain conversations we have with each other in society? Let me take a step back to answer that question. Do I think there's a lack of critical thinking? Yes. But I don't think that's the only answer to it. I think there are the, like, and I think there are multiple truths that we should be able to hold in our heads at the same time, which is part of the hard thing about critical thinking in, in the first place. So I think that sometimes we have an opinion, we can analyze things, but we have been brought up to sometimes in, in our culture and environment to not challenge the status quo. And especially when you are someone who is um, not, um, what's, it, what's the word? It's one of these cycle, this, uh, one of this, um, not, not low in conscientiousness, um, what's the word? I, was, someone who's very agreeable, right? If it's someone who's very agreeable, then you always accept things because you don't want to get into any situation where you have to maybe put up an argument or you don't have to defend your point. So to let things go, you agree. And that affects your level of critical thinking because if you just accept information without validating why you're accepting that information, then you don't think about the information that you're accepting. So I think that it's, it's, it's partly, you know, it could be social pressure. An example could be, you know, you're, you're with a group of friends and you want to go to a restaurant and someone says, oh, I want to eat sushi today, but you really don't want to eat sushi, right? And you're like, mm. Some people say I want to eat sushi, but I don't really want to eat sushi. So I don't want to be like the, the, the lone wolf, so the lone sheep in the group. So I'm just like, okay, I'll go. But if you say, okay, and even if you want to eat sushi and you say, I don't really like that restaurant and you give your reasons why you don't like that restaurant, most people are afraid to do that. But so let's go to um, ramen takeo, whatever you said. Okay, they say sushi. I guess that could not be that bad. Even if you don't want to go to ramen takeo, even if you had a bad experience, and even if you share that you have a bad experience, and you your friends challenge you, you can put your your you, you can tell them why, in comparison to what you proposing. So, I think society has a role a, a role to play. I think our environment has a role to play. I think education, academia has a role to play. You know, I think our traditional education environment has a big role to play. They don't encourage critical thinking. They put us in one path and then they just say, boop, you go. And then they grade us on what they want to be asked to, to know. You know, you like standardized testing. I'm, 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 I'm not into standardized testing. I don't think it should be, it should be any criteria to, to, to measure someone's intelligence, right? I don't, I don't believe in that. But that's how the system is set up. Mm-hmm. So you said you grew up in Cameroon, right? Yeah. All right. So can you I love maybe... Cameroon, by the way. It's beautiful. I bet it is. I can't wait to grow up and travel around the world like those places. But I was wondering, what was the difference between the educational system in Cameroon and between the educational system that you were exposed to in the United States? Good question. So the education system in Cameroon is, it's, it's, we, we took, so Cameroon is bilingual, English and French. Comment de levo, haha, if you couldn't notice my accent. Um, So Cameroon is bilingual. 
and we had two colonial masters, one the English and the second the French. So in the French part of Cameroon, the education system stemmed from the French, France. And the English part stemmed from the English, England. Right. So our education system is fairly is very similar to I'm from Af I'm from the English part, so it's very similar to the way the English system in the the, the, um, the education system in England is so we have um the GCE, England has a GCSE, we have um the advanced level certificate, something like that. England has the same thing. And even the way our in we, we, we speak British English, we don't speak American English, you know, like advice in Cameron is with a C, not an S. So, you know, number one, grammar is different. You know, the way the education system is set up is different. We, in order for you to go to, I don't know, um, how, I don't know how long you have to be in school before you go to the university in, in the United States, but in Cameron it's for like, at the very least, 17 years of education before you go to the university. Um, so, but we have a lot of standardized testing. Um, and I think in America, in order for you to go to the university, you need to take just like the SAT, right? Yeah, the SAT or ACT. Or ACT. So, but in, but in Cameroon, before you go to university, you need to take one, two, at least three, you need to pass at least three of those. So, I mean, it, it's fairly different. The university system is different, three years. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 I would say the education in the United States is, it's, it's, it's more advanced. You know, in terms of like the opportunities, especially when it comes to research, when it comes to the implementation of technology in the environment, not to say, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it, it's just based on resources, right? They're, they're, they have more resources in the West than we do in, in Cameroon. So that's why you see there is this brain drain from Africa to the West. There's lots of smart people in, the, in, 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 in Africa, but because of the, the of opportunities that are, that are presented in the West and both in Europe, whatever, however you want to, you know, like what, what you could study the West, the just resources, opportunities, et cetera, and access to just more advanced technology that you can use to really utilize your God given abilities and skills. It's, 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 it's better here, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Right. That's really interesting that you pointed out the brain drain. So do you see that happening like when you were in Cameron? Yeah, I'm in the United States. Right. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to be in Cameron, but I'm in the United States because of what it's, it's no matter how I look at it, it's part of the brain drain. I want, mm -hmm. I want to live to my potential. You know, I want to be able to do what I think I can do. I want to be able to have opportunities to talk to people like you. I want to be able to have opportunities to, to build my network and to have an impact in my community at large. But unfortunately, some places have it better than others. And we just have to accept that. But my goal is to be able to go back and reinvest in my community so that those that are not fortunate enough to be like me, to be in a situation that I am in, can have similar opportunities or at least have better opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's a really cool plan to have. So yeah. one last question before we go off to the freestyle portion is what is, how did you learn to embrace risk taking? How did I learn to embrace risk taking? So I have, I have a long answer that I'm going to make it super short because I know we don't have a lot of time. So leaving Africa, by myself and coming to the United States, taking a 27 hour flight by myself, coming to Chicago by myself, never seen the snow ever, and going to O'Hare by myself, having six luggages by myself, and coming out of that airport I cannot forget the day. I came out of O'Hare. It was 60 freaking degrees outside. It was 60 freaking degrees, right? And I left. I came out of the, 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 the terminal. I, I think it was Terminal 3 or something. Terminal 5, sorry, because that was an international terminal. And it was so cold, I ran back inside. And someone told me that it was swimming weather. I almost called my mom and said, what's the next flight back to Africa? Because I cannot live in this weather. Like, there is no way I'm leaving here, right? So... The fact that I stayed, it was something bigger than myself. It's a lot of people that sacrifice a lot for a lot of us to be where we are today. And it, sometimes, mostly, often, it stems back to our parents, our loved ones. And looking back at all the sacrifice that were made, 
I cannot live on myself trying to meet the bare minimum because I know a lot of people want to be my position. A lot of people want to be my shoes. So why should I just accept what I can, the low hanging fruit when I know there is so much more out there and in life, in order for you to get the best fruits, you need to do more work and to take more risk. And those are the people that get better opportunities or at least understand how or recognize how to take advantage of those opportunities when they do present themselves. So where I'm from, the opportunities that I have my life, the opportunities that I know that others would like to have that I do not have, there is no reason for me to be okay with just the bare minimum. I'm not okay being average at all. That's, that's really cool. I've, I have a boss right now and he says that we always need to reach for excellence because you, know, you don't wanna just be okay and settle for whatever it is in life. You, know, you have to reach for excellence and you have to reach for what you want, like the high hanging fruit. And, and, and this is it with me, right? I'll even take it a step further. Now, because of the cancel culture, excellence, it's almost like fair because everybody want to make everybody feel good. You know? Mm-hmm. So, and it's not to shit on your boss, but it's just to say that for me, that's how competitive I am. Because I know excellence is almost so easy to achieve. Now, if you have a job that's excellent, hell no. That is a start. God damn it. You know? Mm-hmm. So to me, just the way our society and the culture and the fact that everybody just trying to be so cultural appropriate and so politically correct, everything you do is excellent. So I try to reach above the skies. I don't try to reach for the skies beyond the skies because right, that's so- where people actually make the difference mm-hmm, absolutely so would you say that we would always we always kind of need to reach towards the risk and reach towards being uncomfortable in our lives so that we can grow oh yeah mm-hmm. 100 percent. like I, t- I i tell you guys every day you want to be able to differentiate yourself put yourself out there it's not easy to put yourself out there. And I bet you, it wasn't easy. It's not easy for you to be what you, to do what you're doing right now. You had to push yourself. Absolutely. So I guess that's the same with everything else. You know, if you want to be able, if, if you want to get that VP job, if you want to be the CEO, guess what? That's a competitive enterprise. And you have to work twice as hard, maybe three times, maybe five times as hard. Maybe the things that you're going to face as challenges as a, as, a, as a woman, as a white Caucasian woman, will be different from what maybe a black woman is going to face. And maybe what a black woman is going to face is going to be different from what Emmanuel, the black man, has to face. And that's just the nature of the world. Is it fair? No. But that's just what it is. So in order for me to reach beyond the skies and to understand the journey, I have to take some risk. I have to put up with people that I don't want to put up with. I have to work more. I have to prove myself and take the opportunities when it arises. It could be longer, it could be much more complex for me, but if you don't take the risk, then of course you're just gonna go for the low hanger fruit and you're gonna be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now we're going to shift into the 30 minute freestyle. So if anybody has any questions to ask Emmanuel live, they can absolutely do that now. And by the way, Pat, I want to say before anyone comes on, you have done an amazing job. You should be super proud of yourself. This is super cool. And I cannot wait to do this with you more. So kudos. And I hope that everyone is looking at it. Everyone is watching it. Everyone is like listening and watching you becoming so amazing. I, I, I would think you've done this for so long, Pat. So <laughs> you're super cool. I, I, I love it. Trust Thank me. You. I had so much fun with you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, anybody that wants to come on um, can, can, can definitely come in. We, we can take it on a different tangent and be very, very intentional about, you know, of course, everything has been intentional, of course. But if there's anything that you would like, you would like us to focus on for the next 30 minutes, let's get on it. All right. So does anybody have any questions about religion? 
religion, Pat. You want to go on that route? Let's have some fun, okay? <laughs> Let's have some fun. So, religion. Who wants to talk about religion? I'm not. Okay. Let's talk about religion. Who wants to come on and talk about religion? Pat, tell me about religion. What 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 what, do you, what, what is your religious belief? Oh, my killer is joining us. All right. <laughs> Let's talk religion. You. Yeah. Hey, man. Uh, I, I would say a question about what are your views about being in a relationship or um, marrying someone that has a different religion than you? Not me? <laughs> okay. I don't. Okay. Let me not say I don't care because I'll be just not a real tired at answer. Okay. Um, so what is my opinion about getting into a relationship or marrying someone that has a different religious views than me? Huh. So if it doesn't interfere with my own religion, and if it doesn't make me, if, if, if it, there is, if there is one of these, if it's one of these things where it, I would have to compromise my beliefs and I would have to shift away from my religion to accommodate the ours, then I'll have to evaluate, is it taking me to the same place? I would have to evaluate that. And if it's not taking me to the same place, then I would have to think about it. Is that the place I want to go to? Is that the place that aligns with my views, my values, you know? And it, it, it's tough because when you, when you, when you bring in emotion, when you bring in your, your affection that you have for another individual, your significant other, and you are put in a position where you have to pick between the religion and that individual, it's, it's a tough spot to be in. You know, I, I don't wish that for anybody, but people go into that situation, in, in, people are, find themselves in, in, in that environment every day. So I think it just have, it, it, it has to be a conversation. It has to be a conversation between both parties for them to accept what's more important, right? Does the, being with this individual, does that compromise your own beliefs? And if so, how? And can you find a way to live together amicably and make sure like your religion is your religion, your God is your God? And your love and affection for me is your love and affection for me. As long as we all are trying to do good to each other and trying to be fair to each other, right? And even though it could be hard to achieve with some religions, which I'm not going to go into, but I think that it's worth a conversation and it's worth a compromise if you think it is. It's all situational. But with me, you know, if it's something that really takes me away, then it's going to be a tough conversation. And I think it's going to be a tough conversation. There's no easy answer to that. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I think in a lot of people's like mindset is that people's religions should just stay separate. And I feel like you learn a lot by dating or, or just being in a relationship with people that have different relationships. Um, I'm sorry, they have different view. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you know, it's funny because Sometimes religion is, it, it, it goes beyond the, so, so it's like marriage, right? You're dating someone, you don't, no, you don't just date them. You date their family. I, I always say, <laughs> but when you date someone, you don't just date them. You date their freaking family, right? Their family have, should they, I don't know. I don't have the right answer to that. I can tell you what your family should not, should not do. It's you, 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 you should make that decision for yourself. But I know for a fact that when you date someone, you just don't, you just do not date them. Their opinions are not only yours. It's the idea of their friends that they would have to dissect and reevaluate. Is that of their families, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's tough. You know, if it's, it's about finding that perfect middle, which sometimes is very hard to achieve. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Um, yeah, I, I, I need, mean, I mean, yeah, religion. Like, it's, it's a tough conversation. Like, even with me, you know, like, going to church or not going to church, some people think, like, you know, I mean, let's not even get into all that complexity. It's bad, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. It's a super interesting conversation to have. I mean, I've, I grew up in a religious household myself and I've had friends from different religions and I've been lucky enough to have open conversations with them and have my beliefs challenged. So that's just been a cool experience for myself. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is tricky. I always tell people, your God is your God. My God is my God. Whatever you believe in, if you believe in a, you know, if you believe in, in Baal, if you believe in Allah, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in, you know, the Mormon God, your God is your God. My God is my God. 
and that's just how it is. Great. So do you think for religion, it's how about having conversations about religion at the workplace? What are your insights on that? I think I think it's I think it it, it should be I think it, I don't have any reason why I don't see any reason why not because I think the whole the whole issue of of it's showing when you when you deal with the workplace right it's about understanding what people value and most often what people value stem from religion you know most often that's just that's just the base that's the fundamental root of all of those things so it's important to understand you know what my Muslim friend thinks what is appropriate for my Muslim friend what is not appropriate. You know, why are they wearing a hijab and understanding that and respecting that? Because at the end of the day, it, it goes, it boils down to respecting people's culture. Same thing, like, you know, if I'm celebrating Christmas, right? I would appreciate if my coworkers have like a happy Christmas, even if they don't celebrate Christmas. I would appreciate that. That would be nice. So I think that it's, it's, those are important conversations to have because if you don't have those conversations, then you don't know what people value, what people love, what people would prefer, you know, so I think those are important conversations to have to make sure like you have a more inclusive working environment. Absolutely important. That doesn't mean you have to change your religion, but you have to understand where that person is coming from so you can respect it or at least understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you start those conversations? I think it should all start naturally. You shouldn't just go up like, hey, <laughs> tell me about, tell me, why are you in a hijab? I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I think it's, it's, it should all stem naturally, you know, it, natural conversations. It could be through company social hour bonding, you know, it could be through social events, it could be through networking, or it could just be during lunch break. But you shouldn't force those conversations, in my opinion. I think they should come naturally when the person is comfortable talking about it, because that's when they are more expressive. That's when they are more willing to teach. That's, more, that's when you should be at least willing to, to, to understand because it's not being forced. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. So. Have you ever had a conversation about religion in the workplace personally? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a conversation about, I've had conversation about religion. Yeah. A lot. But not, not like an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 and as I said, right, most often it stems from those different situations that I told you. And it's always natural. It's always maybe over a drink. And, you know, maybe you have, you ha you've had like two shots and like, Oh, Emmanuel, you know, what is your take on this? And maybe there's something that's going on globally, you know, those type of things, those type of situations, those type of events always stare those type of conversation. But yeah, I appreciate it. I love it. Would I like to talk about religion every day? Probably not because it's so, it could be divisive sometimes, especially when they're opposing. So I try to stay for away, away from me when I don't, when I don't need to have those conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. So, did, did you enjoy talking about religion and stuff? Um, just right now, or like in general? In general. In general, I do enjoy learning about other religions, reading books on religion and philosophy and psychology, because I do. I want to know why I think the way I think, know why I believe what I believe, and why I value certain things. Mm -hmm. I don't just want to listen to it willy nilly. You know, I want to know why. So. I do read books on that. Like yeah. right now, I started the book, Why I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. So I've just started it and I'm reading it and it's pretty interesting. Are you, well, okay. Anyways, let me not go into that. I was going to ask you, um, you said you don't have enough faith to be an atheist? Yeah, that's the book title. Oh, oh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Have you, you know who Richard Dawkins is? I've heard about him. Okay. So, we'll, 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 uh, okay. I don't know. We'll, we'll, on this call, who knows about Richard Dawkins, but he's a pretty interesting guy. And he has a book called The Gut Delusion. Oh, I heard about that book, actually. Yeah. Heard about The Gut Delusion? All right, that's a good book to read. But you need to read the book open-minded. Mm -hmm. Not from, an, you know, from a non-taste point of view or from a taste point of view, but just, you know, you want to read what people's perspective are in religion it's a good very deep book super educated guy but some things are interesting in the book you know so did you read the book or started you? reading it okay. yeah i started reading. i have it in my phone audio book oh, nice yeah. yeah but yeah it's it's an interesting book um 
you got the religion. He says, he said he's, he's, he calls himself, I, I, okay, don't quote me. He said on a scale of one to 10, that's a scale that he, he gave in one of his books um, in terms of like the uh, one being he's, he's, he's very religious. He's, he believes in God and 10 being means he does not believe in God. And he said he gave 10 is like an atheist. He does not believe in God. And he said, he said he fluctuates between an atheist and an agnostic where and from the on a scale of one thing he's a nine i think do not quote me but i think that's what it is and it's more so he cannot disprove that there is no god but at the same time he can he does he live his life as though there is no god interesting yeah so interesting book yeah i'll have to look into that yeah pretty pretty interesting guy um uh, but yeah that that i i, I mean he's super I, in terms of my like understanding evolution like he is like a darwinian and he's pretty mm-hmm. good at what he does so I, I i try to follow him to understand you know the evolution of the world and you know how he what darwin the darwinian theory of our existence is and what that means you know so i'm pretty i'm, I'm pretty interested in that yeah i i think you know jordan peterson right of course, I know you. All right. I know he <laughs> talks about religion sometimes. So, like, what are what are your takes from him? I don't really follow Jordan Peterson for religion. You okay. know, I, I I I try to look at he he fundamentally he's a clinical psychologist, mm-hmm. and of course, religion is part of everyone's culture, and your culture and your psych. You, that is part of everyone's being so he has his own take on religion and yeah i don't i don't really have an opinion on jordan's take on religion i I mean i don't really care about it to be honest with you um i he he has some pretty good pretty good things to say about but i i try to just look at my religion in terms like what my beliefs are how does it affect my life am i a good person do i do good to my community am i living my life in a way that affect others positively and or benefit myself only and i just try to assess myself every day based on what i feel is right or wrong Mm -hmm. do you follow jordan peterson i do i don't follow all of his religious things as much i do enjoy listening to his takes on culture and society and the Mm -hmm. way we yeah, a lot more. I prefer listening to him talk about those things. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, anyone has any question? Who wants to join us online? Who wants to join us? Uh, hey? A random question I hey. saw from like, a, what do you all have been talking about? Actually, um, do you think it'll ever be possible for us to accommodate in like the workplace or school? for all of the different maybe like religious holidays or different reasons why people need to have like take time off for um, in the U.S. outside of just like the traditional like Christian holidays and other um, reasons we take off for school like Columbus Day like different things like that. Well I hope number one that June June 10th can be a national holiday to start off with so. (laughs) Yes. I'm just saying if we can have Columbus Day as in as as if is it federal holiday? I and believe we, so. Where can we have June thing? As someone like that's stupid, in my opinion. Like I, 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 I don't, I don't understand it for one second. But, that's <laughs> it. but what I'm happy is I'm happy like leading companies like Nike are giving all of the employees like they're establishing as a as as a company wide holiday, so that's good. Yeah. So there, I work with some people in Europe, and some countries in Europe have like a hundred holidays in a year. <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> it's a lot. So, but at the end of the day, you know, when you have a society as diverse as the United States and you're pro one religion, I think you should be pro all religions. Mm-hmm. But there would need to be a balance. And the question is, if it's, it's going to be a, a human resource question and a question of productivity and what makes, you know, it's, it's not a straightforward question because if you have to take into account all religions, because this is the funny thing about religion, right? If you are in favor of giving holidays for the Christian religion or for Mormons or for Arabs, or what is the one that Tom Cruise is part of? That his thing that 
I don't want to call it thing. Forgive me, but yeah, he's part of this. Um, what's Tom Cruise's religion? Scientology. Thank you, um, Chef. Scientology, right? A couple of other things there. If 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 all of if that is considered a belief or religion or whatever it is, then how many of those exist? And what does it tell me that me worshiping this cup is not going to be a religion? If I say it's a religion, it's my religion. Like, what are you to not tell me that? You know? So, it's a tough question. I remember in one of my classes, um, it actually might have been a religion class, but they were just talking about how it's so easy to kind of create a religion. It is so easy. As more people have become more like aware of themselves and what they like the power that they hold one of someone created like a spaghetti religion mm-hmm. Tricia, can you just google and, and and look at a definition of the first thing that comes up when you def- when you google what what the definition of a, re- of a religion is let's see what it is so google defines religion as the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power especially a, con- a personal god or gods yeah, right. So just right off the bat, you see that it's, it could be anything. The belief no of a superhuman power of a God. Oh, God. Who are you to tell me who my God is? So I think that there's a fine line. And I, I can I, I just. Sorry. You go ahead. I was just saying, I wonder because I know um, a lot of different things. And I went to a conference a while back and they were talking about making more accommodations in higher education. And I'm just curious as if it's something, especially depending on what kind of school you go to, if like if you go to a private religious school or if you go to like a public school, like is there really ever a way to make accommodations for every single student on campus and then expanding it to how many religions there are even in the U.S. and different things like that. Yeah, it, it, it's it's tough, Makila, because as I said, you know, there is no there there is no one God for everyone, and it, even when you look at things like um, I don't want to go into gender, but gender, right? There's everybody. Who are you to tell someone what what their gender is in our society today? And to have an inclusive environment is to just accept all for who they are and what they believe in and what they feel. Implementing that is more difficult than just the conversation. So I think that there are things that people need to come together, have debates, have a dialogue, create policies to ensure that we are treated more fairly and we live in a world that can be more inclusive. I just think it has to be people coming together with different perspectives, sharing their view on a national stage and having a debate to create policies around those things and ensuring that people are held accountable for the decision that have been made based on the policy and the debates that ensued them. Tough stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Yeah, I need, I, uh, I need Chef to come on screen. Chef, where are you? You're hiding. I need you on screen. <laughs> I know you always been hiding though. I want you. Hiding. <laughs> yeah, I I know I I was listening to you, to you a bit about religions and gender and that's that's totally my peak cuz I I studied sociology in college. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm always just kind of thinking about how how it intersects and and how how we bring it into different environments and everything. What is your view on religion? My personal view? Whatever you feel compelled to share. Yeah. So I, for me, I, you kind of summed it up really nicely. My religion to me is very cultural. It is about what has been passed down to me, the teachings and the beliefs and, you know, the practices that we do, how we view death, how we come together, how we celebrate life, all that. It, it is a part of our culture so yeah. i think even if you don't necessarily believe in it you can believe in like how it brings together your family and and your the people from your family yeah religion is so personal and you know 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a conversation that I don't think I'm qualified to go deep into, but at least I think I have an opinion about it, which I'm going to share my opinion. I don't care what you say, what that person says. It's just my opinion. That's what the whole idea of a conversation is about. And, I, and one of the things that I don't really like about our society today is that we are so fast to cancel people when their opinions and their perspective doesn't align with ours. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a free guy. I like sharing my opinion. I'm going to share my opinion. I didn't, I'm not forcing anyone to believe my opinion. It's just my opinion. I'm not trying to force it on you. And I think we need to live in a society where people feel free to share their opinions. You know, people are okay with something different. Are okay with the fact that I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a Zoom call or I'm on a Pfizer chat with Patricia, Michaela, Michaela one, Michaela two, and Danny that is not trying to come on camera, and Irene and everybody else. And we are okay having different perspective about religion. And we are okay talking about it. And I feel a set a sense of like a some sort of like anger because what Emmanuel is saying doesn't align with what Patricia said or Patricia believes in. I think that we need to accept our differences more. And if we do. And I think we're going to accept other things that are important in our communities that are not shared perspectives so that we can live amicably amongst each other. So. Yeah, we're yeah. just so different. We're so different. So there's no way we're all going to have the same opinions and opinions aren't fact. They're just different. Yeah, they're not. So, but well, thanks, thanks, thanks for sharing, Michaela. So if you went back five years ago, did you envision that this is where you would be? No. <laughs> You're not. Not at all, Patricia. Not at all. Uh, five years ago, no. Five years ago, I was going to be thinking about making money. Yeah. Not having an impact. Because I convinced myself that serving others and charging them retainers was me having an impact. But it was not. This is having an impact. What I'm doing right now has an impact. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to, nobody knows where they're going to be five years from now. You have an idea where you where you'd like to be, but I don't know where I'm going to be. But what I, what I, what I know my plan is, and, and you know, it's about, you know, what opportunities come my way and how can I serve my community? How can I serve people more at scale? So I hope that I'm going to be in a position where I'm doing what I'm doing, but at a much larger scale and impacting more people. What that impact is gonna be, I'm not sure. I can tell. If I could, then what would be the fun? Life, the, my life would be ruined because I know exactly what I'm gonna be five years from now. What's the fun in that? What's the excitement in that? There's no excitement in that. It's gonna be a boring life. And I love the mystery that life presents itself with. I love the challenges that comes with life. I love the challenges that comes with entrepreneurship. I love the challenges that comes with just me being a human. So I don't know. We don't know. No one knows. We can only hope that we're going to be in some place better than where we are today. Because if you don't think, if you don't want to put yourself in a, in a position where you want to be in five years from now, you don't want to be in a better place, then what's the worth of that next five years for you? And for me, every day counts, every second counts, every hour counts, every minute counts, every second counts, every microsecond counts. So I want to make sure that for the next five years, what I'm going to do is going to put me in a position to do more, to do better, to be a better person, and to speak to more awesome Patricias. Thanks. All right, that was an excellent question. That was an excellent answer, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. You've given a lot of us a lot to think about. And I can tell for sure that you are impacting hundreds of people just by doing what you're doing and just by doing the fireside chat, you're impacting all of us individually. So I've learned something new every single day because of you. So thank you so much. And I can probably just tell you that everybody else has learned something. New. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's humbling. And that's my reward. That's my pay, guys. That's my pay. That's what I do, what I do. That's the reason for what I do. To ensure that I can impact just one person. If I can impact one person, that's all I care about. I guess I'll close it with saying thank you to everybody who has come. Thank you, Emmanuel, for giving us so much insight on not only religion, but on business as well and on your values and on life and books that you've read and everything else that you've done in your career. 
and the challenges that you've brought all of us to think about. So just thank you so much, Manuel, for impacting all of us. Thank you everybody who's asked a question, who has listened in. It's been a great time. See you all next time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patricia, and you are the best. Thank you.